cube minus s cube 3 over 2. Uh, they can be obtained by solving a Panavé equation, hard asymptotics and so on. But at least they can be, I mean of course you don't get things from nothing. But using the knowledge about exclusion process and some physical reasoning, you can paste, you can build an argument at least to understand these exponents. So this is not at all in the mainstream of what I said, but I just want to give the argument because once again I, re I learned it from my very good friend Paul Krapivsky. Paul Krapivsky. Who loves these kinds of arguments. And as I told you a few days ago, they wrote a book with Sid Redner and Eli Benaim. And the book is absolutely crammed with hundreds of arguments in many models, statistical physics, everywhere. Whenever there's a calculation, they try to find some argument to justify the result. Of course, you can never get the constants or things like that, but at least the so this argument he taught me, but it's in his book also. So there's a long chapter about exclusion process, large deviations, not so much, but he gives this argument. And the argument is the following. How can we, how can we understand the S exponential S cube and the exponential minus S3 over 2 just by um, physical reasoning? So I recall you that the current to the first bound is given by t over 4 plus t one third times psi. Again, the argument, it's, it's just an argument. It's not something to be taken too seriously, but it gives the right result. By the way, Paul is very, very good at this kind of arguments. And uh, he's one of my closest friends, so don't take it from. But he can build arguments for anything even for completely wrong uh, uh, estimates. But I mean, he builds 10 arguments and uh, often he's right, but sometimes he's wrong. I mean, the complete calculation doesn't give the right answer that he had before, but he always has some argument before doing a calculation. And I think this is a sign of a very, very good physicist. Whether it's wrong or right, it's another question, but he's good enough to be able to find something. So here, so this is the current, remember this is the current through the first bond. Okay. So how do I make this very small? It's always positive, but how do I make qt equal to zero? What is the probability that I have no current during time t, not a single particle that's jumped through the first bond? Well, it means that this guy has not jumped. But what is this guy? This guy, it's a TASEP, if you wish. He doesn't care about what's happening behind him. It's just a Poisson process with an exponential waiting time. So in fact, the probability that this guy has not jumped is exactly the same probability as decay of a radioactive particle, whatever you like. So the probability is of the order exponential minus t. You buy it? OK. Well, then qt equal to 0, this means that xi, OK, I call it xi now, not chi. I don't know, find it easier to write xi. This means that xi is of the order of minus t two third. Qt equal to zero. I don't care about the minus. So t is xi is proportional to xi to the power three over two. So this gives you that. It's trivial. Yeah. So this power law just is related to the Poisson or exponential decay, exponential minus t. It's nothing but that. Again, I mean, to get the formula, to get the constant is infinitely difficult, but the power law is trivial. Okay? So this is the very trivial part. The other one is more, more complicated. I'm not sure I will remember it, because these kind of arguments are always, you know, just on the verge, so you may. So we want to know what is the probability of getting a huge current. The problem is if you want to get a huge current, in fact, in a continuous time process, it's even boundless. Because you can make uh, one billion particle jump in the microsecond. This is very unlikely, but 
it can happen okay and this is beyond control so that's where again comes the the subtlety of Paul's cooking abilities he says okay but all these things they don't care about the model we are studying I mean uh, we can if we stay in the same if we believe we stay in the same universality class it's not really important that I'm talking about TASEP, continuous time TASEP, discrete time TASEP. If I take anything which is a bit similar, it should give me the right exponents, the right behavior. You follow me? So to avoid this boundlessness of the jumps of the particles, let's take a discrete time exclusion process, OK, instead of having a continuous time. And let's take a discrete time exclusion process with, that's always a problem with discrete time dynamics. You have to tell precisely what you do. And you say that a particle jumps, any particle can jump now, with probability one half if the next site is, is empty. So this one can jump with probability one half, and so on and so on. Whenever a site is empty, a particle can occupy the next site with probability one half. So it's a slight modification. Of course, as usual happens, you do a slight modification, you don't know how to do any calculation anymore. It's very probable that for this model, better and that will fail. I don't know, I never tried. But it becomes a different technique. But at least the model on physical grounds should not be too different. But now it's a discrete time, so we will not have a huge amount of jumps in a given time. Okay? At least they will be exponentially suppressed also. So now let's start with the same initial condition. In this new model, so parallel dynamics, discrete time, and so on. And look, what is the probability that I have? So I want to have large excursions. So I want to have QT over T of the order of something finite, bigger than one fourth, the order one, let's say, one, one half, any number which is bigger than one fourth. That's what we call large deviation, j bigger than one half, okay? So let's say one, order one. We're not putting any number anyway. So I want to have in time t, discrete time t, t particles hopping through this bound zero one. I want to have a current t. No choice. This guy has to move at least t times. The second one, t minus 1. The third one, t minus 2, and so on and so on. At least. This is the minimal. Of course, he could move more, but it's less likely. So the first one has to make, this guy, first one, has to make t jumps. This occurs with 1 half to the power t. The second one has to make t minus 1 jumps. This occurs with 1 half t minus 1. And so on and so on. It's 1 half to the power 2 minus power t, t minus 1 over 2, 2 to the power minus t squared, exponential minus t squared. You get it? Yes, everybody? So this is the estimate. So it's exponential minus t squared. But you want this thing to be of order t. And again, psi to be to this to be of order t psi has to be of the order t two third so it gives you psi cube which is this one got it so okay I mean it's not a proof huh? it's just an argument and as I I told you I mean I love these kind of arguments but I'm not very good in making them I'm very fascinated with the people who can really build them, I think. But I imagine that if here we had a five, Paul would have found something to get five, something astute. But again, it's a, uh, I really admire this ability. Maybe some of you have it, and if you have it, it's a, it's a, huge, it's a huge advantage in life, at least in a physicist's life. In daily life, I don't know. Okay. So I wanted to teach you 
Well, I'll tell you what I'm not going to do, just to be honest. Maybe I'm not sure if there will be an after class session. I think we are all, all quite tired. But uh, maybe if we have half an hour. But I don't want to put it now. It was meant to be after, but I don't have enough time. I told you about coordinate buttons arts, very little about functional buttons arts. Now in full glory, there is something which is called algebraic buttons arts. This is a huge subject, which is very beautiful, very mathematical. It is very close to these operator algebras that we study with quantum mechanics. A dagger A, creation operators, and so on. It somehow patches what I have taught you, this coordinate, co coordinate better on that, with some quantum, quantum field theory is a big word, but at least with some oper operator quantum mechanics. The idea is that you can create these uh, better wave functions by making some action of creation operators with momenta. I'm not going to, to tell you about it. But at least historically, this was built by Baxter and the Russian school for the EF at all by studying equilibrium statistical mechanics and the generalization of the Ising model, statistical physics, and the generalization, one generalization, which was studied by Lieb also, of uh, the Ising model, the so-called six or eight vertex models which are equilibrium models in two dimensions. And you probably heard there's this kind of general philosophy, uh, non-equilibrium in deep dimension plus one time. It can be mapped to D plus one equilibrium. Quantum mechanics in D dimensions can be mapped to D plus one statistical mechanics. It's a kind of general feature. And indeed, there is a mapping between the exclusion process and the six vertex model, which is a very respectable uh, equilibrium statistical physics model. So this mapping can be explained in 10, 20 minutes. I may do it, but afterwards, it requires doing some drawing on the blackboard, and I'm quite bad at it. But it's a, it's a very cute mapping. So OK. And then once you have the six vertex model, you can build something which is called a transfer matrix, which generalizes the one-dimensional transfer matrix that you have probably learned for the 1D Ising model. And this transfer matrix, uh, the transfer matrix of the six vertex model, it depends on some coupling constants, like the J in the Ising model, J, S, I, S, J, this Ising model thing. Psi plus one. So it depends on some coupling constant. And typically, there is one coupling constant which people call lambda, the the, called the spectral parameter. And the punching line of all this blah blah is that the Markov matrix of the ESA and even the deformed Markov, non Markov deformed matrix which allowed us to compute the current and so on, they can be realized as special instances for values of the weights of this T lambda. More precisely, they are given by, and it's not, a, it's not by chance, they are given by a logarithmic derivative, T prime of 1 over T1, just like we had R prime of 1 over R1, Q prime of 1 over Q1. They there is a formula which relates the Markov matrix to some logarithmic derivative. This is a one parameter dependent transfer matrix of one parameter dependent vertex models. You can consider it for any value of the parameter. And the AZEP Markov matrix can be realized as a derivative, as a logarithmic derivative of this transfer matrix for some special value of the parameter which depends on your convention, 0, 1, pi over 2. Is this a bit clear, or is it much too? I never realize when I make a kind of speech like that, whether it's completely 
fuzzy and uh, and uh, semi-philosophical, or if it's uh, followable? Can you just tell me for if one day I have to teach again, so that I can at least uh, improve? Did you get more or less what's going on? And there is this classical model, which is called the six vertex models. It has some coupling constants like the Ising J. Call it lambda. And the beautiful thing is that not for a special value of lambda, but almost, there is a way of reconstructing the Markov matrix of ASAP from this general transfer matrix of these equilibrium problems. And by the way, you remember that we had a Q lambda and an R lambda, or QT, but I cannot call it T now, because T is something else. In our functional better ansatz equation, it's not by chance. The polynomial, this is a polynomial in lambda. This is a matrix, which is a polynomial in lambda. OK? And it so happens that its eigenvalues are also polynomials in lambda. And guess what? Q lambda is, in fact, the eigenvalue in lambda. So that's the way of getting directly the functional better ansatz. You play with these transform matrices. You do this so-called algebraic better ansatz. And you get an equation for the set of eigenvalues taken together of this matrix, and this is the functional method on this equation. That's the other route. The more elaborate, the more I'm not going to talk about. But the crucial thing that I didn't tell you, which is really the key point of all that, that realized, is that I have this one parameter family. There are many more, but we specialize it to one parameter family of transfer matrices, and it has an absolutely incredible, wonderful property is that if you take two different values of the parameters, lambda 1 and lam lambda and lambda prime, a priori they correspond to different models because the weights have changed, the coupling constant have changed. But these two transfer matrices, I didn't tell you what it is. Maybe, maybe later I'll tell you what it is more precisely, but just after the end. But these transfer matrices, they commute. And this is the key thing. And this is, in fact, related to, in fact, it's a, this is due the same thing as young baxter equation. But now you see, you don't see it. Everything is hidden under the carpet. This is the same thing as the factorization of two body collisions into three body collisions into two body. Well, it's impossible to see it, but it's really the same thing. Okay. Yes. So, yeah. Thank you for asking the question. Of course, when you teach, when you say things which are not very precise. There's, always, there's huge gaps where wrong things can, can be filled. So I was just using an analogy. This is a six vertex model. There are generalizations of Ising model. But in fact, the Ising model is not included in that. Okay? The only thing that I wanted to say is this lambda is akin to the J parameter in the Ising model, but it's not the same thing. So in fact, the question you're asking me is for J, ferromagnetic are not ferromagnetic, but in fact, this lambda appears in the weights of these models that I have not defined to you. It's a coupling parameter, like the J, but it's not the J. So the conclusion that I'm drawing are not valid, really, for the Ising model, per se. The Ising model is a special case of the eight vertex model. So maybe there are some other things that you can say. There also, there is a coupling constant. In these models, there are many coupling constants. There are six of them. And it's only some special families of coupling. You have to vary them together in a certain way to get the same physics. Again, I'm going, something to, going to say something completely crazy, which has nothing to do, but it's an analogy. If you have a fluid, another fluid, if you have the same Reynolds number, you have the same physics. But of course, you have to vary viscosity, length, velocity in a similar way to get the same Reynolds number. Same here. You have many couplings, 
but you have to make them depend in a parameter in the same way. So you have to change them in the same way. Maybe also related to renormalization, maybe. But you have to change them in the same way so that these matrices commute. Okay? So this is not just changing one and leaving the other ones unchanged. So the key point is that they commute one with the other. So they can be diagonalized together. M being a derivative, of course they commute with their derivative. M also commutes with them. So the Markov matrix of the, of the AZEP can also be diagonalized automatically with these matrices. And now you see it start looking like quantum mechanics. You have a system of operators that commute, like in quantum mechanics. You want to diagonalize them together. And here starts the game with this creation operators and so on and so on. And the whole algebraic better on that game. From these operators, you can build creation and destruction operators and start building the states, just like you learned to build the states of uh, harmonic oscillator with this A and A dagger starting from P and Q, P plus IQ, P plus minus IQ, and doing, playing with the algebra. So of course it's a long thing. It's not, it's not 10 minutes thing. It's a few hours of work. It's quite difficult. It's very beautiful. And this embodies all the things that I told you before, Young Baxter, Diamond Lemma, all these things now becomes hidden into the algebra. So you don't have to write the coordinates and a, sig a sigma, a sigma prime, all these things is washed out, but at the expense of having a much more difficult formalism. So what you win on one hand, you lose on the other, you have to spend more time learning. This is probably a full set of lecture. I mean, you can extend it to 20 hours. I mean, you can find on the web long lectures on this. You can reduce it to two, three hours if you really want to, to put it on the core. But this is heavy. But it has the advantage is that it is more, um, more versatile than the coordinate that turns out. For example, I was very careful in talking to you only about the periodic case. But you could have asked me, what about the open boundary case, which is finally the most interesting case, which, was, which we solved, in fact, recently. I'm not going to talk about it here. It's too technical. I will probably talk about it at the ICTS on Thursday, but not here. I was planning to talk about it, but it would bring us too far. But there, the coordinate that turns out is useless, whereas this kind of more elaborate technique, which contains the coordinate that turns out as a special case, um, works. It should work. And of course, the coordinate that turns out, you always talk about exponential z to the power x1, z2 power x2, you could have asked me, why not some other functions? Of course, well, why not? And then in some cases, you have other functions. But all this is encompassed by this formalism. OK, I don't want to tell more about this now. The only thing I could tell you about is a pictorial explanation of the relation between AZEP, the six vertex model, and maybe also, I should tell it again later, KPZ equation. Well, maybe this I will tell now. OK, I still have. OK, so the second thing I wanted to talk about, um, and I will just summarize rapidly. Does it again on a ring? And let's do the better on that again and again. I could have done it, in fact, simultaneously, taking just a special case, q equal to 0, p equal to 1. If you do it, and this I encourage you to do it, at least for n equal to 2 and n equal to 3, if you do the ratios, well, you remember the z1, zi, zi plus 1, zi, zj factor, the quadratic factor had a q in front of it. When q vanishes, it goes away. So if you redo the better on that, not redo, or just copy the formulas that I gave you, you will find for n equal to 2 that you have this very simple and nice formula. OK? So let's do something we didn't do. Let's plug it back into the better wave function. So there is an overall constant. A, A12, I call it A, and then I have Z1, X1, 
is equal to x2 minus the other one. Nothing really fancy here. Is it okay? I just plug it back and I hope I didn't do a mistake. I think it's okay. Okay, A, I can choose anything. It's a global constant. So if, if I change the name, you see, I, I want to make it more, more balanced. I mean, why this guy has everything and this one has nothing? It's not fair, okay? So I can write it just slightly, just multiplying globally. Just trust me, but you can do it. I can write it like that. It's just an overall constant will be di which would be different as a determinant. Can you read it? Okay, it's just it's a, just an observation. A nice observation, I think, due to Gunther Schutz first. I'm not completely sure. But the people who really, really developed it much later are guess who? Tracy and Widom. Okay, but okay. It's just the same thing up to an overall constant. So this is a good representation of the better wave function. I'm not quantifying the z's. There are better equations, z1 to the power l equal to z2 to the power l equal to. I'm just writing the form of the wave function. Well, the beautiful thing is that if I, if I go to n equal to 3, I have six numbers, a1, 2, 3, a2, 1, 3, blah, blah, blah. I can write the ratios. I encourage you to do it. It's only six numbers. And then you will see that you can massage the formula just by plugging. And guess what? You will get z1 x3, 1 minus z1 cube, and so on. So this is a representation of the better wave function for three particles. Again, then what you have to do is to solve the better equations for, this is only true for Tazeb. But it's a miracle. It's a miracle because when things take the form of determinant, they become computable. So this is psi 3 for 3. Psi of x1, x2, x3. Do you follow me? OK? And sign will be the same. Of course, I'm not going to write it like that. Psi for n values, the better wave function for TASEP. This is not true for the general exclusion process and makes things much more difficult. And here, Tracy and Widom had to do an extremely difficult work to be able to write the wave function using incredible combinatorial identities on rational fractions. It's just incredible work. They had to do that for the general case. But at least in the TASEP case, this is very simple. And I will write it like determinant of zk to the power xl over 1 minus zk to the power l. It's exactly the same thing. This is the generic, the generic term. This tells you that, in fact, the TZEP is a very special process which belongs to a class of extremely important mathematical processes which are a huge chapter, really, of mathematical, of probability theory. It's a determinantal process. <coughs> so this is studied by many, many, many people, including Alexei Borodin, Ivan Korvin, Tomohiro Sasamoto, who's a, a physicist, but mostly mathematician and Okunkov, Andrei Okunkov, who got the field medal for such kind of things. And this is related to pure mathematics. <coughs> when you have determinant, well, you can imagine, when you have the symmetric group determinants, you have algebra, basic algebra, which comes into the game. 
determinants and symmetric group are related to the so-called Young tableaus, and this becomes a part of representation theory. So this is a very beautiful, I'm just throwing words, maybe some of you, it evokes something, but it really gives a, a bridge between probability theory on one hand and algebraic representation theory on the, on the other hand. This is just a huge chapter of mathematics. You can just Google and you will find plenty of paper, conferences, workshops devoted to that. And fortunately, and that's why also why Shedra is not here today, he was asking me why is the exclusion process so important? Well, because it's one of the simplest, or maybe the example of a determinantal process. And somehow, this is the most well understood, the most studied determinantal process, and it's used as a kind of a benchmark for studying all determinantal, all the other ones. So it's really something which means deep mathematics and combinatorics. Okay, so this was general. And then now let's go, let's be bold. So this is really a very nice paper by Gunther Schutz 15 years ago or more, which remained unknown almost till these people passing with them and so on generalized it. I think he did it only for two particles or something and just inject a general formula and then people took it over again. Let's now go to the infinite system. Because see, I told you no better equations. We don't want to, to be annoyed with some better equations. We don't want to have any quantification condition. Then the best way is to go to an infinite system. So what is a natural question? I take an infinite line at time t equal to zero. These are sites. And I put n particles. n particles, so a finite number of particles, two, three, five of them, on certain positions. So here there are some stupid conventions. Particles in this game are numbered upside down. So this is called x10, x20. So this is the position of the third, second particle, third particle, and I don't know, the nth particle. They are here. OK? And now I let the system exclude. This is a totally asymmetric exclusion process. So the n particle evolve on the infinite system. No periodicity condition. And they will go somewhere at time t. So I don't know. I mean, this one goes here. x1 at time t, x2 at time t, x3 at time t, x4 at time t. So this one goes here, 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 and so on. xn at time t. OK? Now the basic question, the basic observable, which will contain everything, is a green function. What other people call green function, here it's a probability. What is the probability at time t that I reach x1t, x2t, xnt, knowing that it was at x10, x20, xn0? This is nothing but a green function. So if you know how to solve that, you know everything about the system. If you know individual indiv evolutions. Well, this you can do using better on that. This is a beautiful thing. You can really s write an equation for that, and this is due to Tracy Widom. Again, building on work of Schutz, but which was more restrained. You can build that using the better wave functions. So can you tell me? This is basic physics. Can you tell me how? without thinking about better on that, the details, and so on. This is a set of eigenvalues of my Markov matrix that better on that gives me. But we don't care about better on that. Somebody gives me this. Sorry? We don't even need that. This is a, an eigenvalue, an eigenvector, sorry, of TASEP. And the eigenvalue, remember, is sum over 1 over zi, i equal from 1 to n minus n. This is the associated eigenvector. So what do I do? I write the yeah, if you wish. I just say that I at time t, I have to dec I mean I have to decompose my initial condition on this basis and then evolve. As as usual, I mean what is the wave function at time t of x? It is the sum or the sum 
over the energy levels of the eigenfunction x exponential i e t times the coefficient alpha e. You know that, and or maybe the sum if you prefer. I just decompose my initial condition on my basis of wave vectors. No, no, this is general. This is quantum mechanics. I have any operator. If I know the eigenvectors, the eigenbasis, I can do the spectral decomposition, whether it is optics, acoustics, quantum mechanics, any linear physics. If I know the eigenmodes, I can make the evolution of the sound in a drum just by decomposing my initial bank into the eigenmodes and making all the eigenmodes evolve separately. This has nothing to do with AZ, beta, and Zs, or this is a general scheme. You, you all know that, yeah, of course. All of you, in one form or the other. So I just make a spectral decomposition. So this, in fact, alpha E is, in quantum mechanics, you would write it like that, phi E psi zero, because we use bracket. But we don't really need. It's just you, if I have any vector, I decompose it on the basis of the eigenvectors, I have some coefficients, and each eigenvector evolves exponentially with its eigenvalue. So no, this is not on the ring anymore. This is an, inf sorry, yeah, yeah, infinite line. Huh? Hmm? You're right. You're right, I, I forgot to say something, thank you. Okay, so this was on the ring, because we did, but in doing that, we never use the periodicity condition, because the periodicity condition comes as an equation for the z's, and uh, it, it's the better equations. So if I do the same procedure, and I never use the periodicity condition, I'm not saying that I am on the ring anymore. That's why somebody asked me, why does, two days ago, why don't we take into account the fact that the last one, x, n, can back, come back, I think it was you, and can hit it? Well, no, to, to derive that, I just use the collision condition between 1 and 2, 2 or 3, 3 and 4, n minus 1 and n. And I never talk about x, n, and x, 1, and I never close the ring. So, yes, I should have said that, sorry. These are also eigenfunctions with the same eigenvalue for this operator finite number of particles on the infinite line. Just because it's the same thing. They are doing the same thing. So if you write the, the, the master equation for n particles on the infinite line, it will be the same equation. You just don't impose a psi of x1, x2, xn plus l is xn, x1, x2, xn minus 1. If you don't impose that, you're just on the infinite space. So this is indeed also a set of eigenvectors on the line. And it's only when I impose periodicity that I get quantification of the better roots through the better equations, and that I have to solve them, and that I'm on the ring. But just like plane waves, plane waves are quantified on the ring. They are not quantified on the, on the infinite space. So here, these are not quantized. They don't have any equation. They can be anything. So, we will want to write this as a spectral decomposition on the general, taking into account the initial um, condition. So now I'm slightly going to change notation and come back to normal notations because we are on the line. So what, instead of using the Z's, I will re revert back to impulsions to wave numbers, because it's much more, it's visually much more nicer. And so ZL or ZL, I call it exponential I, P, L. Just to emphasize the analogy. And what we can write is that it's just a, so we have n particles, the better wave function 
So it evolves like that. So the eigenvalue is exponential minus E B L L from 1 to N minus N. I'm just writing everything in terms of, of these, of, of P's. Some factor which depends on P1, PL, and the initial condition X1, 0, Xn, 0. Okay, I will take later of this. And by better equation, the determinant. By, and I put exponential E, K, and so on. Okay, and this determinant. And the determinant, let's be very explicit. I will just write what it is. So you probably remember that if I have a matrix A, I, J, the determinant of A can be written as sum over the permutations, epsilon sigma, A, I, sigma, J, product of A, I, sigma, I, which is what I A, I, sigma, I product 1 to n. You know this formula for determinants. Yes? Just developing the determinant. Is it okay? So I, I, don't, I really don't need to write it, but I prefer to write it like that because then there is a chance that you maybe you can even see the formula, the final formula. So P1, and this is just the better way function, of course. Pn x sigma n but forget about beta. I just use the formula for the determinant. 1 minus exponential i p1, sigma 1, and so on. I let it finish. Let you finish. Now, the only non-trivial problem in this decomposition is first to know what, what is the range of these wave numbers. But because I wrote it as wave numbers and put the 2 pi's, you guess that it will be from minus pi to pi. This is non-trivial, but OK. And how can we compute this amplitude? This is not trivial. OK? If we had a Fourier thing, the usual thing we do, we have Fourier modes, a k x, and the initial condition is just x minus x0. We are used to that, to get a delta function. Well, the miracle is that the same thing happens here, up to uh, just a constant factor, some prefactor. But the miracle is that this amplitude, you can just cast it into the determinant by just subtracting the initial conditions here and subtracting some numbers here, sigma 1 minus 1, and so on. Somehow, I mean, I'm going too fast. Again, I'm not entering the details. But somehow, the most naive guess gives you the correct spectral amplitude, the, the correct Fourier modes, if you wish. If you think about this as Fourier basis, generalized Fourier, it gives you the correct modes. And if you wrap all this together, you get a very cute formula, which I don't find again. It's a disaster. Um, what is the formula? As before. But everything now gets into. So you see, this is a eigenvector. And now I'm giving you a green function with respect to time. It's always extremely difficult to go from eigen modes to real time evolution. It is also a very difficult thing to do. Even if you have eigen modes, which is always already non trivial, then you have to use these eigenmodes, decompose your initial condition, and make it evolve. Here, everything can be done. And the green function is known. So this is, so everything can be separated. And you have this beautiful formula.
times the evolution, the temporal evolution. P K. So you see this is a matrix element. This is the AKL matrix element. You have to put this into a big determinant and compute the determinant. Okay, it looks awful, but it's not. It's not because these functions, in fact, can be computed exactly. They are just polynomials. What happens, and this is really what Schutz saw so in his old paper, in fact, this can be done explicitly. And I will give you a formula. This is just a determinant of a set of functions, f l minus k of x l minus x k zero t. Okay, so it means that you have to write these functions in a big determinant. What do they, do they look like? Now let's take an, take an example. Um, I mean, you can do it yourself, but one one term is f0 of x1 minus x10. One, one two term is f1 l equal to 2k equal to 1, f1 of x2 minus x10, and so on and so on. And you just complete the full determinant. OK? And now, of course, I have to tell you what these functions are. And they are quite simple. They are just polynomials. I mean, they look like, they look like Poisson distributions, which is not a big wonder, because everything here is a bit Poissonian. But you have a, an explicit formula for fm of x and t. So there are different cases, m positive and negative. But it's one special case is this one. m, m plus 1. I'm just writing it to show you that it's not abstract bullshit. I mean, it's, it's very concrete. Factorial r, t to the power x plus r, or x plus r factorial. I mean, you don't have to copy it, but this is just explicit. OK? So you know how to write the green function. OK, now, again, I plan to do it, but it's always like I was just too naive. and. Things are very long. The beautiful thing is that you can even forget about all that. If I just give you the formula for the, for the green function and give you these functions, you can prove directly that they describe the system at time t. You can prove that dpt over dt is the Markov matrix time pt with the, with the correct initial condition. You know, just like, suppose you never learned about Fourier and so on. If I tell you that the solution of the heat equation is exponential minus x squared over 4 dt divided by square root of 4 pi dt, you can just plug into the equation and check it. And nobody tells you that it comes from Fourier modes and so on and so on. Just the solution, you plug it. And here, the beautiful thing is, and it's two page long, but it's very elementary algebra. Again, it's first year of university algebra. Just by taking this result, you can plug it, forgetting about, about better ansatz, about anything. You don't need to know it. You can just check that this is a unique solution with the correct initial condition. So it really gives you the position of the particles at time t. Okay? So it's a formula. You can take it as a basic formula. You start with it. You don't know how they found it, how they did it. You just have it. And now comes the, the very nice thing. So just take this formula. And let's compute some things. Now that we have the whole evolution, we can compute some simple things. Okay. I really want to go to macroscopic fluctuation theory. So. <clears throat> That's a probability that the particle, the left 
the most particle, nth particle. I have n particles here that the leftmost particle, so this one, label x10, has jumped has jumped m times, at least m times. And we don't care about the others. Of course, because the others are in front of it, they have to give space. So the, there's a probability that this thing is at least m, this distance, okay? It has advanced at least by m, m steps. So of course now you can write it abstractly in terms of this general green function. So it's a probability of x1, x2, xn. Knowing that, so I choose an initial condition. I choose a special initial condition. I put them, well now you can guess, just like what I did this morning. I put them all squeezed between 0 and, so I put, I put one here, one here, one here, one here, one here, one here. So there are n of them, xn at time 0 is at side 0, xn minus 1 is at side minus 1, so x1, the leftmost, if I'm not wrong, is at side minus n plus 1, okay? choose this initial condition and then I let them evolve. They do whatever they like. But of course I want that this guy has jumped at least m sides. So if, we, if you look, now that we know the basic probability distribution, it will be the sum of this. So this is 0, minus 1, minus 2, minus n, minus 1. and so it means that this side here is bigger than m minus n because it has made m jumps. Okay. So I have to make this sum. And these are given by the determinant formula above. Okay, do you do you follow? Of course, I'm not giving the details, so it looks a bit abstract, but should be followable, I hope. Okay, I just want to be precise. Okay, now look at something. So, now comes the, the key observation, which is, as often the case, a totally non-technical and a very trivial observation. I'm not so much interested in the jump of a particle. I'm much, much more interested in the current through this bond, the 0, 1 bond. As this morning, I want to compute how many particles have jumped through the 0, 1 bond. Yes? I want to know how many particles have gone through this bond. So what is the probability that QT the number of particles that have jumped through this bond is bigger or equal than m. Well, it means that at least m particles here must have jumped through it. Okay? So it means, so this is for the last particle, but of course I can do it for any particles, is the probability if I have m particles, suppose I have only m particles, that the last particle have made at least m jumps in time t. To have a current which is at least equal to m, it means that the m particles here must have crossed it. So it means that the m particle here must have jumped at least m sites. This is clear. This is trivial. Okay? 
to have a current of m, the m to guy must have crossed it. And I don't care about the others. So we can just forget about them. Because the other, it just does that. They don't influence what's, what's going on here. OK? Is that this probability, in fact, even for general m and n, is p m n now I erased but just by the same type of manipulation. So let's take both of them, and then maybe I change a small m into is some normalization times an integral. Not, so the normalization is from 0 to infinity. Now it's from 0 to t, where t is the time. And now you should jump to so dx1, dxn, exponential minus some over xj's, j equal to 1 to n. Uh, plus or minus, I don't know, m minus n log xj times product of 1, the van der Mond determinant of xi minus xj square. You should now have a kind of, uh, OK, if I call x lambda, what do you see? Let's take m equal to n. We want to study the first bond. So even the term there goes away. I can put here the log. Okay, forget about the twos. There may be a four because there's a two here. I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's not there. I think it's too late now to correct all these things. But of course, you recognize something which looks very, 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 very much all that you have been learning with Satya during the few last days. The only difference is there is no square here. There's a positivity assumption here. Okay. But it doesn't make a big, it is different. But fortunately, this is also, how do you call it? This is a random matrix problem. So it's not the GOU, the GOL, I don't know what, the Gaussian orthogonal. The, it's called the Laguerre ensemble, but it is well known. And it corresponds to some Richard, the same Richard, of course. Huh? that Satya started with, we shot matrices. So you start with a any matrix, which is called A, which is n by n, but not necessarily anything special, not, uh, not Hermitian or anything like that. And you make a, a dagger. So this one is Hermitian. And this is the formula for the largest eigenvalue of this type of matrices. So now you understand why Tracy, we don't, and everything, because it's the same problem. You just fall into exactly the same type of problems. OK? It's just, it's just, in fact, there is a very deep connection. This I showed you by the calculation. You can show it by combinatorics. It's also a very beautiful way of showing it. It was the way it was done initially by Johansson. Beck and Delft. So the person behind that is Johansson, early 2000s, I think. Johansson, it's a kind of classic paper. He did it by pure combinatorics, by counting Jung tableaus. But he understood that the statistics of the current of the exclusion process, or the statistics of the position of a particle, which is related by this trick, is nothing but the statistic of the largest eigenvalue of a random matrix. It's the same problem. And things merge together. And there is also the Carter Parisi Zang equation, as I told you, the six vertex model. All these things merge together. And it ended up, as I told you this morning, that you can really, really use the formula for the largest eigenvalue of a matrix. 
And you can really say that the current, so like QT, is given by T over 4 plus T one third. So T plays the role of a size here. And there is some bizarre 2 to the power 4 thirds chi, where this is a Tracy Widom variable. So here's a connection. Okay. Here's one way to understand the connection is to go through Betton's arts, write the evolution, the green function for the evolution on an infinite space, write it in the determinant form, which is something extremely useful, extremely fruitful. In fact, Tracy Widom did their analysis not from this formula, or the equivalent formula that Satya wrote. They, they went to determinants. You need determinants to be able to do asymptotics. So they wrote it in the form of a determinant. And then you can connect it to the tracy widom um, Yes, yes. And as I told you, it's a, this formula is really first year of university level. If you know determinants and you add lines, columns, permutation, I mean, you can really transform it as an exercise for a elementary exercise in determinant calculation. It's no, it's a, it's a finite, it's a finite series. Yeah, and in fact, sometimes it's infinite. It depends on the sign. But f has a very nice recursion formula. F f prime m plus one is m f f m fm plus 1 plus fm is f minus 1. So you have a few recursion relations which help you to add and subtract the columns and the lines of the determinant. And it's a very, if you know these few relations, there are not 20 of them, two or three of them. You just manipulate the determinant, and by brute force, you end up here. OK, this was not the original way. The original way was Johansson, some beautiful combinatorics. This is something I find absolutely, it's infinitely more beautiful than better than that and so on, but it's much more mathematical. It's combinatorics and, I mean, I was meant to teach the better on that, and it's a useful tool for solid state physics, and, but it's very beautiful, and that's how he arrived to that. But there's a more elementary way. Here? Yeah, but I, there was an m minus n, log lambda j. Yeah. So there is a product here. There is a product of the lambda j's to the power m minus n. But I took m equal to n, for example, just, just as a special case. But you're right, if it's n here, that would be m minus n. But no. So then, OK, all the details are important. So that's really the connection between, between uh, what Satya said during this course of lectures and this better on that and so on. And how much time do you still leave me? Half an hour? Well, it will be enough. I want to finish with macroscopic fluctuation theory, which is very different from all that. But I want to give you a taste of that. And maybe one day you will have some advanced lecture on this thing. Uh, this is TASEP. Let's consider another problem related. So Tracy Widom were able to generalize it to any asymmetric exclusion process. Even though you don't have a determinant, the formulas become very complicated, but they were able to do it. I told you they wrote 15 papers on the exclusion process in the last three, four years. Just on, I mean, so it's, uh, they have been very active on that. And one of your colleagues, uh, Arvin Ayer, was a postdoc with Tracy, so he's probably very, very Bef after being a postdoc with us in, in Saclay, he's very knowledgeable in these things. So let's now take another problem, which is the other extreme case, which is a symmetric exclusion process. And again, I cover all the left particles, and I leave the first one empty, the right one empty. Now, now particles are allowed to jump backwards and forward. And you can ask the same question. What is the generating function of the cumulants of this current? So it will be quite different from the totally asymmetric case, or even partially, because this is symmetric. In the long time limit, 
that's why I wanted to show you that it's not in t but in square root of t, okay? And there's a function here which we call e of lambda. Let's call it f. And it's a function of lambda, but not a function quite of lambda. It's a function of omega, where omega is exponential lambda minus one. Okay. And the function f of omega is very pretty. So it's very, very pretty function, not related to all that we have seen. There is an explicit formula for this function, one of the square root of pi, sum, n big O equal to 1, minus 1 to the power n minus 1, omega n over n 3 over 2, I think. So you see it's a and you can find an easy analytical continuation of this formula because this is only valid for omega close to one, less than one, sorry, close to zero. But there's a very trivial way of continuing it, very simple. You just expand the log and get it. It's an art of finding analytical continuation, but here it's simple. Just expand the log with respect to omega and compute the decay integral, and you'll get the same thing. That's a very good formula. And again, we have, we can compute the cumulants. So we can compute the average current. There will be an average current, although it's symmetric, because of course there is diffusion. So the average current is in square root of time, t over square root of p, pi. The variance has a nice formula also, and so on and so on. QT. Sorry, I have this very bad habit of going from upper cases to lower cases without realizing it. T over square root of pi. You can go to the third cumulant. Still T over square root of pi multiplied by some number with square root of three and so on. And you can find the the large deviation function has some exponential minus square root of t, g of q, and so on and so on, which behaves like q cube for large q, and so on and so on. All this very nice work was done by Derrida again, and his student at that time, Antoine Gershenfeld. Gershenfeld. Okay. Again, using better results, it's a very beautiful paper, and they were even even able to generalize it further. If you have a finite density here, finite density here, and so on and so on. Okay. So there is one question we don't know how to do, and we are trying to to solve. Is the question of this is the question of the current. Now suppose I mark a particle somewhere, and I call it a tracer, and I want to know the same problem. I call xt the position of the tracer at time t. We don't know how to do the same calculations. And again, all this is quite technical and relies on better ansatz, on the infinite line, better ansatz for the symmetric case. The expressions are much more complicated. You don't have determinants but they somehow pop out through the calculations, and so on and so on. But now I want to conclude this series of lectures by somehow trying to kill everything that I said and going totally backwards. You can tell me, okay, I mean, this is very nice. I mean, all these problems, it's very technical and that turns out, and it's heavy, each problem to solve takes weeks or months. The people who are playing with that are, most of them, I'm not talking about me of course, but most of them super smart people and it's just horrible. I'm a physicist. I want to find a physics way to, to deal with these things. I mean you, you're talking to me, you're talking to me. Um, you try to sell me all your things with a kind of stupid model of a pipe between two reservoirs and I agree with you, it's a very 
you talking to me. It's a very physical model. I want to understand that. Physics has to understand that. No Boltzmann weight. But do I really have to, to study all that? I mean, to do all this arcane mathematics. OK, beautiful. But you probably had to be a bit pervert to love these kind of things. And you, no. I mean, there should be another way. OK, so yes. Yes and no. So this is going to be the last few, maybe not minutes, but 10 or 15 minutes of these lectures, opening to further learning from you, if you wish so. There is now a way, people think, to try to understand this kind of problem without having to do all that. This is, I like physics. I want to understand things in a physical way. So what do I have? Well, I have a pipe between two reservoirs at different densities. It's a very large pipe. I don't care about exclusion, not exclusion, whatever it is. I just want to describe that. So how are you going to describe that? Something of length L. You have a current. You may have some field, which scales like 1 over L, a weak field, which goes 2L maybe, which pushes a particle if they are charged. And you want to understand that. OK, how would you describe that physically? Well, you have a local density rho of x and t in the pipe. You have local current, small j, big j, I don't know, g of x and t. In this simple model, particles are not destroyed or not created in the bulk. So you write a conservation equation. It's one dimension. It's, otherwise, we put a divergence. I mean, you're a physicist. You don't need to do, we don't need to do arcane mathematics to, to write that. Now, what is the current now? Well, the current is. Uh, minus gradient of the potential, minus gradient of the density, has to be, with some diffusion constant, which may depend on local density, if it's a kind of nonlinear material, complicated material. So you see, I'm just really trying to, I'm trying hard, it's hard for me, to do physics. Okay? And so this is the current due to local density gradient. And there's also the current due to the field, okay, and the current which is due to the field is just the field which is new. The one over L will scale out. It's intended to scale out. This you can do by yourself. It's very easy. Multiply by some diffusion constant. Uh, sorry, susceptibility, response, susceptibility, conductivity. I mean, really, this you really don't need to learn. Better on that. This is the beauty for physics, somehow, if you want. It's just common sense physics. I write a diffusion equation or conservation equation, and I write a constitutive equation for the current. And the current, I know it has two origins gradient density, density gradient, plus field. And what is the response to a field? This is the field. The response to a field is conductivity. This is basic. OK, so I just uh, plug it in. Just plug it in with the minus signs. I put back the gradient and so on. And just to be fancy, in any dimension, minus new gradient of sigma. Of. The only thing I need to know is this local density, local diffusion constant, and local response coefficient. OK, so this thing, for example, is quite difficult to prove. The proof of this, mathematical proof, physical proof is trivial, there's no proof. But the mathematical proof was again done by Varadan and so on, and his collaborators. Also Lebovitz, Spohn, Anna de Marcy, Presuti, in the 80s and early 90s, I think, for the exclusion process. For the exclusion process, because this is the, the exclusion process is the toy 
we try to understand things with. It tells you that d is equal to 1, and sigma is just there's a factor, there's a stupid factor of 2. It's a question of normalization, but it's again rho 1 minus rho. Because we know that the current is p minus q rho 1 minus rho, and p minus q is the local intensity of the field. Okay, this is very nice if you solve it with some initial condition, with boundary condition, you will find a density profile. But this is not what we want to do. As you remember, what we want to do is something more elaborate. What we want to do, and this is what I told you two or three days before, it's, I don't find my notes anymore, we want, this will give you the average profile. I don't know what it looks like. It depends on if d is constant and even if we take sigma to be constant, or it would be a linear profile. It can be a curved profile if it's more complicated. If nu equal to zero, it's a linear profile. But we want something more complicated. Remember, we want the probability of seeing any profile at time t and any current at time t. And this, I tried to convince you, that there is a large deviation functional of the current and the density. And I tried to convince you that this large deviation functional is the important object, which allows you not only to calculate the average profile, this is for the average profile, but also fluctuations and even large excursions very far away from this average shape. This would, as I tried to convince you, if you remember well, in the case of an equilibrium gas, forgetting about the current, this was the free energy. This was the integral of free energy, rho t minus phi, rho bar f, rho bar t. So I really try to sol sell you the fact that this is a free energy analog of no for non-equilibrium systems. And as I told you, Leibovitz, Speer, and Derrida computed that for the exclusion process, for example. But we want a general scheme without having to use matrix on that, better on that, any on that. We want to find a physical way to calculate that, that function, that rate function. Let's call it I, not to overemphasize the analogy with free energy. I want to compute this I. Okay. Okay. So this is what people have been working on in the last 10 years, slightly more and which it's not done yet, but a very substantial progress has been made by the Rome School, many people, but the, you can say that the fatherly figure, the, the leader, the, I don't know, this is always complicated, but yeah, you can say that Malazigno, it's Giovanni Giovanni elderly person, around 80 years old, together with a whole team of mathematicians, Bertini, I will forget the names, Landim, and there are others, uh, Gabrielli, De Sole, and so on and so on. It really began as a very abstract mathematical tool, but it can be recasted in much simpler physical language. The idea is to rely upon local equilibrium. And finally, once you know the result, it always looks simple. But it was really a long route and difficult route to reach there. And they proved it. So it's not only hand-waving. They showed that this picture can be extended. This is an average picture. We want to have a fluctuating picture. We want to have rho, which can have excursions beyond its average value. Well, this picture can be extended by just as adding a Gaussian noise term to this to this current. So there is a Gaussian noise contribution with an amplitude which is given by the same susceptibility, which is here. Okay. So now your equation here 
it will have a, it, let's not write it completely, but it will have a stochastic, you all learned about Langevin equations. So it will be a Langevin PDE with gradients and so on. It will be a kind of Langevin heat equation, nonlinear heat equation. It's mathematically a complicated object, but physics physicists have been playing with that for a long time, for percolation, for, I don't know, there are many models in, um, even in statistical physics where we have noise, Carver Parisisong, if you wish. And the nice thing is that the noise here, it's a white noise, with a vanishingly small amplitude, which vanishes inversely with the size of the system. So it's a weak noise. It means a weak noise that fluctuations are small. You're close to the classical limit, if you wish, or you're close to the settle point. L is very big. There would be a settle point calculation to do. OK? And now, the thing is, you can put it back here, in fact, it's a of sigma. The thing is that this is a Langevin equation. Okay? It's kind of complicated, but it's a Langevin equation. So you can write, I plan to do it, but I think I, I will not do it now. It's a few minutes, I, I prepared it. It's not very long, but I think you know enough now to, to believe me. You can write the probability of rho at time t as a path integral. Do you agree with that? You can write a path integral. It's not very difficult. If you wish, OK, I can come back to this later. But you can write, because you know the weight of uh, the, the Gaussian noise. So you can write the probability of having rho x t g x t knowing rho at time 0 and g at time 0, you can write it as a path integral. So the problem with path integrals is that they're always very long to write. But let's write them. So a path integral over all the rows, all DJs. Of course, all which started with row zero at time zero and ended so this may look really daunting, but it's in fact amazingly easy to derive. Much more easy than most of the things we have done here. So of course you have the compatibility condition which comes from the conservation and you have a weight. So this is a kind of, this is, if you wish, there is some technicality here, but it's a kind of black box, it's automatic. I give you a Langevin equation with white noise, there is a path integral. If you don't know how to do it, go and see and ask somebody who knows to do it and he'll do it for you, she'll do it for you. So, or you learn to do it and you do it. But there's, there's nothing. The, the, the crucial point was to write the equation correctly. From here to here, it's purely technical. And although it's very heavy and so on, it's much easier than what it looks. It's just heavy to write. OK, I rescale the size of the system to 1. And then you end up with something like that. Which is quite natural, I can just tell you in one second where it comes from without doing it. In fact, even if you don't know how to do it, you can write the, path, the result without, without knowing how to do it. But of course, it's better to be careful and so on. OK? How do you get that? 
It's in fact very simple. I told you the noise is like that. So it means that the weight of the noise is something like that. It's a, because it's a space-time noise, you have to write path integrals. It's L psi square. Okay? You with an integral. Because you have, if you just discretize psi i tau, you will have all of them here, sum, and so on. Now psi, just eliminate it from this equation. Again, sorry, my capital and uppercase and lowercase letters are the same. Huh? So if you just eliminate it from this equation and put it back into psi square, you just get that. You really don't need to do anything. Of course, if you want to learn how to do it properly, you have to go some through some field theory, very little. Otherwise, it's just trivial. You agree? You just, you have a Gaussian measure for the noise. You know how to express the noise in function of the current and the density. You put it back. But the nice thing is that here, L is big. So you can do saddle point. I'm almost ending. And the saddle point, don't forget that we are looking at some kind of large deviations. So we are looking at a function of this type. Well, it just tells you that I of rho and g, which is my large deviation functional, large deviation functional, is just given by the max or the mean, there is a minus sign, of this number, of this integral. Because saddle point tells me that I have to take the mean of that, there is a minus, okay? And means just by identifying that this is given by the value of the saddle. That's what Satya has been doing, taking the saddle value. So it just gives you a formula for the large deviation function, functional. It tells you it's the mean. Let's remove everything. Just the mean of that. over rho and g. Satisfying the relation that rho d rho dt, of course, I have to keep conservation. So I just have to, and now you should, okay, of course, I have to remove the exponential and everything. So you, you see, this is a huge progress, although it looks very naive and so on, but I told you at the beginning, we don't know how to generalize entropy, free energy, and so on to non-equilibrium processes. And then I told you that we think that the right generalization are made by these large deviation functions. But I told you we don't have a general scheme to compute them. We don't know. We can express them as mathematical functions, probability of la 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 la, but how do we compute them? And then, okay, we try to compute them by using sophisticated techniques either random matrix techniques in the case of random matrix eigenvalues, that's what Satya told you, or better on that techniques in the case of the exclusion process, and we got some precise fine results on some very precise models. The advantage of that, so of course I didn't tell you this is not true for all possible models. It has to be weak, it has to be diffusive, it has to be weakly asymmetric. For example, the TASEP does not fall into that game because the TASEP corresponds to new going to infinity. There are plenty of things that have, have put into the carpet. But globally now, for driven interacting diffusive systems, there is a kind of global scheme. And the only thing which I have to know from microscopic dynamics, like, just like in hydrodynamics, where I have to put by hand the value of viscosity, of heat conductivity, and so on, I have to find, to know, or to calculate from microscopic dynamics the value of the diffusion constant and of the susceptibility, the conductivity. And then for a large class of interacting systems, I have an expression for the large deviation function. Okay, now I have to minimize a functional. But you know how to do that. Euler Lagrange equations. Of course, this becomes a purely classical problem. I have a Lagrangian. Okay, it's a bit ugly, but why not? And I just apply Euler-Lagrange, this you learned. 
So D D L D D T D D L over Q dot is equal to D L D T or I do variational calculus and I get equations. I don't know if I write them for you, but by the way, if I'm interested only in the density and not in the current, I have to minimize that over rho and j and then optimize over j. So I have a double minimal procedure. If I'm interested only in, in j and not in rho, okay, so it's, this contains too much information. I can contract it, that's the technical word, as if I have a function of two variables, I can integrate one. So I will get the large deviation for the current, large deviation for the, for the density profile if I want only one of them. So now I can use Euler Lagrange variational method, and I'll get some equations for the so called optimal profiles. I will find rho star, again, same notation. There's a great unity in physics. That's, that's what, beauty, what is beautiful. Of course, Satya and myself, it looks very similar because we work in similar subjects and we work in similar places, just a few minutes apart, and we know each other. But even if you take people from further fields, in fact, there's plenty of similarities with what even uh, what Sumit told us. So it's full of similarities. So we will find the optimal rho and optimal j. But okay, I mean this I really, really, really don't have the time. I'm finishing in a, in a few minutes. It's really the very end. Uh, there are some transformation of variable and so on. The nice thing is that you can go to optimal p and q, which are variables which are made from these ones. I'm really not entering the, the, and you will find equation like that. Q dot for the optimal, Q is really rho, it's star. But P is something different. It's a conjugate variable. The nice thing is that, in fact, it's a Hamiltonian system. It's a Hamiltonian structure. Okay, so these are probably the last equations or so that I'm going to write. You will find some nice system of coupled equations, which again, the only microscopic information that you need to write these equations are just the diffusion constant and the sigma, the susceptibility. So they look like they are coupled. There is a Hamiltonian, so they are really Hamiltonian equations. I mean, there is a Hamiltonian such that Q dot is dH, I'm not writing it, dP, and P dot is minus dH dQ. It's a Hamilton density. So it's a field, it's a classical field theory with momentum and position. But as you can see, these equations, they are complicated. They are nonlinear. They are second order, nonlinear, coupled. One thing which is quite horrible, especially for mathematicians, but not so much for physicists, is the minus sign here. You know, if you put a minus sign in front of a diffusion equation, it has a tendency to collapse. And you know, it can have a singularity. If you diffuse from a delta function, it will become a Gaussian. But if you anti diffuse from a Gaussian, it will have a boom singularity in a finite time. So these are stiff equations. I didn't tell you about boundary conditions. They are quite complicated. But I, I am not the only one. Let's think about it. It's quite an exciting time, in fact, for, for physics, at least statistical physics, because we have now a scheme for understanding not all, but a large class of systems out of equilibrium, a very large class. And we have new equations. And in fact, these equations, they are not ugly. They are very symmetric. I mean, you see, they are quite nice. And it's not every day that we have a new set of equations, quite generic, which can be applied to, very, to various problems. You know, just like having a new set of Navier-Stokes type of equations. It's not every, Navier-Stokes equation have given work to people for 200 years at least. And it's not over. As you know, turbulence is one of the major open problems in physics and applied mathematics. 
So I don't say that these equations, I don't know yet, nobody knows if they're as important as the Navier-Stokes equations, but at least they allow you to describe systems far from equilibrium. Okay? I can take row one and row two as much different as I wish. They, there are some underpinning hypotheses. They're not totally general, but they are far enough general. Okay? So now there's more and more people for the moment being quite a few, but it's growing. People who are trying to study these equations to develop numerical methods because they are stiff, because of this minus sign, to develop numerical schemes to try to get solutions. For example, one of my colleagues and friends, Yarif Kafri, in Israel, is working on that. Also the Kurchan group in Paris and other people. Some people are trying to develop some approximative scheme, you know, like they look a bit like Schrodinger or heat equations, so you can think about WKB methods, things like that. There is a small parameter hidden somewhere, because as you remember, there was a mu everywhere that has here gone a bit astray, but it's still there, it's hidden in the boundary conditions, so there is a small parameter. So you can do perturbative expansion. You can try to measure some consequences of these equations. So it's a new field. It's quite, it's quite exciting, okay? The problem is, and that's where I'm just wrapping around and, and finishing, the problem is that even if this is a very general framework, nobody knows of any non-trivial solution of these equations. What I mean is, Nobody knows, for example, in the case of the cases I've shown to you, Hezeb, Hezeb, this derrida gershenfeld thing, and so on. Nobody, we can write the equations. So then what I said 15, 20 minutes ago, then we could get rid of beta on that, random matrix, matrix on that, whatever you wish, and just solve these equations. The problem is that nobody knows how to do it. We can write the equations, but we cannot extract beyond some non-interacting case which amounts to taking sigma linear. Then you see they will decouple. If sigma q is q, this is 1, they will decouple if you do a d equal to 1. So you can solve in p, in fact, by putting p is equal to exponential something, it will become linear. You solve in p, you can solve in q. But beyond the case where the particles do not interact, we just don't know how to solve them. And precisely, what has happened up to now is that to test this theory, to see if it's correct, what's the only way? Is to test it against exactly solvable models. Because we don't have any way of solving these equations exactly or directly. What has been done is precisely what I have been telling you about in the last six, seven hours, is that using better on that, matrix on that, so we are back to it. People, many people have been able to derive exact formulas for large deviation functions, for profile densities, for current things, current fluctuations. And then, using these formulas, you can plug the result into the equations and check that it works. You see? So it's quite strange. We have equations. We don't know how to solve them. On the other hand, there is one simple model one and some other ones which are similar to it, on which we have very elaborate techniques, arcane techniques, I agree with you, dry and complicated techniques, but by using these techniques we can beat these models to death almost and get some formulas. And the beautiful thing is that then these formulas, we can check that they fit into this framework. But we are not able, none of the results, I think that I've told you, maybe one at most, but still, are, no, none of them can people extract it directly from these equations. Okay? For example, and this will be really the last few words, I, I think some of you will probably work in a related field. Recently, with one of my, with my postdoc uh, nowadays, whom you probably know, some of you, Tridip Sadhu, we have been trying to understand using macroscopic fluctuation theory, using these equations, the problem of tracer diffusion 
in this symmetric exclusion process, which we cannot do either by better on that. So this is a simple problem. You have particles on a line, infinite line, put them everywhere with a finite density rho, let's say one half density. You look at one particle which, which was at zero at time zero. You take the exclusion, simple symmetric exclusion process. You know that the position of the tracer on average will be zero on square average will be square root of t divided by p, 1 minus rho over rho, blah, blah, blah. But we don't know of any higher moments. We don't know how to compute the probability distribution function in the case of the symmetric exclusion process. We don't know how to calculate the large deviation function. And the hope is to try to extract information from these equations or to be able to generalize the better on that solution to get it and then to plug it here and to see if it works. This is precisely what we are trying to do. So I think I will, I will end here. So look at, yeah, these equations are quite nice. So they are called the macroscopic, this is called the macroscopic, I don't know if I said the name, macroscopic fluctuation theory. And if you look on the web, there will, you will see more and more papers on this subject. But for the moment being, this has not killed, far from it, the subject of solving exactly models. Because when you have an exact solution, it gives you something that you're sure about and on which you can test other theories. You can test approximations and you can check things. And as I told you, for example, this theory has not been generalized in the case of, in fact, it's only valid in the case of weakly asymmetry. How one plus epsilon, one minus epsilon for the jumps. But if I take P and Q equal to three fourth, one fourth, and even worse, P equal to one and Q equal to zero, we don't have this theory yet. One day somebody maybe will be able to write similar equations in the case nu going to infinity. By the way, here I wrote the equations for nu equal to zero, I think. Yeah, these are the nu equal to zero equations is another term otherwise. So, okay, I hope you will be able to do some, some progress in this field or some other fields. And thank you very much.